now here's what we're going to do. The first thing I want to do with you tonight, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit bold with you, okay? There's no way that I can uh, teach um, the type of teaching that I do without explaining some basic Greek to you, okay? And I'm going to make it, I tried to make it as succinct as possible. But I want you to write, I just wrote on my tablet, I want you to write some bullet points about Greek. And there's a reason for this, because once you get to understand, we're talking about Greek verbs, this is not going to be complicated. I don't want you to go, oh, wow, I, I, don't, I don't know any language. And when she does it, my brain just goes dead. Because some people are like that. They just, oh, no, you know. I was doing fine until she started talking about that Greek or that Hebrew and that, you know, that reflexive, intensive, you know, infinitive, passive aorist. Stuff. So I really need to get this across to you. And let me explain why. I really do understand how the English is extremely deceptive. And I'm not blaming the English language or the English translators. But when you can identify specifically certain things in the Greek, clarity can come, great clarity can come. So I want you to just make bullet points. Just write them down, and then I'm going to try and do this diligently each time I sit down to try and give um, a thumb line of something. If I'm going to do grammar, I'll try and give you the, the, the outline, a very brief outline. So when we do a lesson, if there are newer people following along, they're not left out in the dark. And even people who have been here 30 years, not everybody's listening and going, oh yes, the Greek says da 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 da. So just a brief outline, all right? Greek verbs. And I promise you this is, I got it on one page, okay? So that tells you it's succinct. I mean, they get Greek verbs on one page. It's like, wow, okay. So, um, so let's look at this. In Greek verbs, you have tense. Usually a time element, so past, present, or future. Now, those are just the basic ones, all right? Duration of the action, relation to the time some other action takes place, whether at the time an action is completed. So tense, that's just a brief idea about what tense is. Whoops, wrong direction. OK. Next we have voice. So in the Greek, you have active, passive, and middle. This is important. Let me get a new page. Pretty much this can apply. You could probably apply this anywhere, but okay, here's my beautiful stick figure. So active, this person, we'll call this person I. Uh, active, I am, even though this would maybe kind of function more in a part, part, participial way, but I am walking. The, the, the subject of the sentence is doing the action. That's the active voice. I'm doing so. I'm talking to you right now. That's active, all right? Passive, let's go back to that page. Passive, so, so here let's do this. Subject is doing, acting, just, it's just a basic thing. Passive, the best way to understand passive is, let's go back to my stick figure, because that will probably work the best. Passive, so, Let's do this. This is a king. The king, the king was crowned. Now, the action was performed on the king. So when you think passive, think, now this, um, this is the most basic thing. So you know, for you who are more advanced, don't go, oh, well, that's not the sum total. I'm trying to give you just the absolute core what you need to know. So when you think passive, the best way to do this is to think, 
I stand still and something is performed upon me, to me. I am the recipient of it, but I did not, I did not initiate any action to receive it, okay? Then, let's go back to the middle. So, let me do this. Passive recipient. So, that's what's happening here. Middle voice, we would add in English um, something in the reflexive nature that is for himself or herself. So, what happens in the middle voice, I am doing something for myself, for my own interest, something that I'm, I may be acting, I am doing the action, but it is for myself. One of Dr. Scott's greatest examples is in Ephesians when it talks about ex alexito, that God chose out from among others he did not choose for himself. So there's a prime example of the middle voice. So there you have these three, active, passive, and middle. Then the mood is like this. And technically speaking, this infinitive should, should actually go underneath participle. It doesn't really fit as a mood. Uh, I'll explain that just general. But indicative, indicative, we usually call that the fact, factual, um, like as, as a, a statement of fact, something that is denoting or connoting, something that is a fact. Subjunctive, we tend to translate as something that may happen. And when we use the subjunctive, we also in English use something called a modal. Would, could, may, should. Um, it helps to express something that may happen. There's a possibility. These are just very general, you know, there's, if you want to get serious, there are volumes of books just on the subjunctive, for example, just volumes of it. And, you know, right down to the top of the pin needle, all right? Imperative, go, do, it's a command. Now, infinitive, as I said, shouldn't belong here, but I'm putting it under mood just to say it belongs there. So when you think infinitive, think that most of the time when verbs are in the infinitive, they usually have no time limit and they have no person limit on them. You don't really need to know that mastering it just as a fact. Optative, we're gonna, we'll skip over that. Participle, we've looked at many times. Participle is kind of, um, we've called it the magic seahorse. You know, it's like two things stuck together. It's a verbal adjective, however you want to explain it. It's two things in one. But I tend to treat the participle most of the time. We encounter it, especially in Greek, as a verbal participle and therefore I treat it mostly like a verb. In Greek, we also have person and number. And this is quite simple. Person is first, second, and third person. And number, basically, you'd have singular, plural, and will include neutral as well, neuter or neutral. So that's pretty much the most basic. It's on one page. Come on now. That wasn't that bad. Some of you are like, Right? Breathe deeply. Wasn't that bad? But there's a reason, there's a reason why I want you to, to, to at least get the basics. I'm not asking you to learn Greek if you want to. I mean, stick around long enough and, and y y you know, that's just going to rub off on you. It doesn't matter how or what, it's going to happen. But the reason for this, first of all, is, of course, we know that we're dealing with the New Testament and the New Testament was written in Greek. Secondarily, if we want to better understand um, concepts, it makes it a lot easier. So tonight, uh, I'm gonna, you know, I've got like 50 different things on my lap I wanna talk about and I'm conflicted as to, <laughs> as to which one I wanna do first. Um, let me find my, this will make a lot more sense, let me find my my rapture sheet here. <laughs> now, you know, in the community of, of P2, 
people, in the circle of people that I talk to, um, there's a lot of people that uh, tend to, I guess, maybe not think that the rapture is uh, necessarily a, a scriptural, you know, some people say, well, it's a fabrication. It, it, it can't happen because, you know, if it was, if was that, if it was that important, um, Jesus would have talked about it. And there's a lot of people out there discussing whether or not it's possible, it's impossible. And so I want to tell you up front, I kind of set a course. I'm the blank canvas, I told you. I set a course just like I did when I told you I was looking for a way out after Dr. Scott died, I was looking for a way out. People were saying women shouldn't speak in the church. And man, I went to town to look for every scripture that would give me the license to say, sorry, can't be here. And of course, I'm still here, so that ought to tell you what I found but, and the conclusions I came to. But I, I want to approach some of these concepts the very same way. And that is, when you become certain of something, it's not because you feel, I feel this, or because grandpa and grandma and brother over here said so. It's because you can point to the scripture and know this is what the scripture says. Now, I've gone through a rainbow of things, and I'm still not done. But the one thing I wanted to touch on tonight um, is the word for rapture, which we know, I've told you this before, we know that that word comes to us from the Latin, from the Latin word. So essentially this was um, something that once we were dealing with a Latin text and people w went to that word, they saw the word repair and that became our word for rapture. But in reality, if you wanted a cognate, a better English cognate for the Greek word, you would probably be using the word harpoon, just saying. Um, it's amazing how we can get sidetracked, and you start hearing people say things. Um, of, of the majority of the books that I have read, m the majority of the people writing, and this is, God forgive me for saying this, but it, I just see it as a true thing. I see people regurgitate, you know, they take one great scholar, and then you'll have one great commentator, and 25 people have taken from his work and basically regurgitated. And in fact, errors are perpetuated. You'd be surprised. I have a couple of commentaries that I've just, I just circle the errors and go, wow, this is not right, because I know I've just finished looking it up. This is not right. And I know I can trace back the source of where they got it from to the first goer of the mistake, usually. So it's interesting how you'll read in some of these books and they'll say, well, the rapture wasn't talked about or discussed. It wasn't even a doctrine um, before people like Darby and Margaret MacDonald and others of Schofield Bible began really to, to make this some, somewhat known. Um, and, and albeit Darby, um, and we'll, we'll, I'll do a little bit of history on him, maybe not tonight, but in, in the next festival or two. Um, it seems like it was certainly made popular by him, but to say that it was not preached or taught before his time is a gross error. And the reason why I'm saying that is, again, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not done. I'm a research person. I, I go digging in places where most people would not think to look. And yes, sometimes we have to go to texts that for some people might seem to be spurious or dubious, but I'm looking at all the information. That's how I'm going to make my decision about things. So there is something I'm going to read to you tonight. I actually made a copy. I have it in book form, but the book itself is not in the greatest condition. I was kind of worried about breaking the spine, so I printed out the text of the book form. It's not very long, but it's a, um, it's a sermon from, again, they, th there's a lot of tossing around on how this should be dated. Uh, the earliest sources put it to the 4th century. Um, the ones who just want to be hardheads put it to the late 6th, possibly even 7th century. Nevertheless, it says that sometime before the 8th century, somebody was talking about a rapture. Now, this is, this is one. 
But actually, as I started digging, I found other texts, which kind of made me feel like, okay, we've got people, for example, like, let's take Martin Luther. Martin Luther believed the Lord would return, but comb his writing to find out how he approached if there was such a thing as a rapture, and you won't find it. Or there, there's a scant reference in one of his commentaries. But I mean, is, if you start combing through people who were great exegetes and, and expositors, you'll find that that area is kind of somewhat quiet. Now, and I don't know if that's deliberate, as, as if to say these people essentially accepted a certain doctrine and therefore concluded that all must know, or they didn't believe it was true or didn't even consider it and therefore didn't write about it. But the one thing that, as I said, I wanted to clarify, so we're going we're to do a little word study, and along with the word study, it's necessary that we have some grammar to be able to identify something properly. I think you'll be surprised that even if we were simply to throw the baby out with the bathwater, indulge me for a minute and don't twist my words, but I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. You know, the people that say, well, that, the, the rapture is not in the Bible, and that can't can occur, that it can occur. It's kind of like it can occur, therefore it, it won't occur, therefore, right? But the problem is that there are a few texts that represent grammatical absoluteness to the concept of rapture. So we have to be, we have to be able to look at things first in a, we want to read the Bible spiritually. We also want to be able to read it analytically when it comes down to these things which formulate doctrine, right? So the first thing I, I want to do with you is, um, I was thinking, where's my Bible? But it's on my lap. All right. So you'll have to forgive. Again, I have um, kind of scribbled out some, all of the occurrences of, of what we're calling the rapture word, which is harpazo. It occurs 13 times. Let me read you briefly um, a little bit of what I've dug up on this word. So from the patristic Greek lexicon, to snatch up, to seize, to carry off, to usurp, to seize upon, to pounce upon, to catch the eye, to claim, to take, to appropriate, whether justly or unjustly, to overpower, to rescue, to seize, um, from Liddell and Scott, harpazo in the medial form, harpazo mai, to snatch away, to carry off, to steal, to be a thief, to seize hastily, um, to overpower. And lastly, from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, to take something forcefully. In the New Testament, the word is used in parables which speak of the conflict between the kingdom of God and that of Satan, with not necessarily, not limited, but most of the time with thought of speed. Um, so let's take a look at, and I said, this is my handwriting, so you know it's not going to be pretty. All right, let's take a look at Matthew 11:12. When we study a word, it's important to get a sense of how it is used throughout. First, we determine how it's used. For example, if we're trying to determine something that's in the Pauline corpus or the, the epistles, we want to look at how Paul used it first and how he understood it. If we were trying to isolate something in the Gospels, we might first look at Mark, secondarily Matthew, and then Matthew and Mark's uh, Use may differ slightly from Luke because his Greek is different and John is in a completely different category. So depending on how we're going to look, but then once we're going to look at a word, we have to look at all of its occurrences to get a feel and understanding. So let's, um, you can go back to that for a minute. We said uh, Matthew eleven twelve, And remember, we're just trying to get some essential meaning. So in Matthew eleven twelve, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So as you can see, I've underlined force there. And I want you to take a look. I've put the Greek, and then I've coded it. So to the far right of the page, 
you will see, for example, that first one is a verb in the indicative. It's present and active, second uh, plural. But the reason, I don't want you to write all these down. You don't need to do that. But I want you to see the first one is active. That's probably the main thing I want you to see. It's active. Present, which means ongoing and active. And let's take a look again. Let's read it again. Remember, we're looking at this word harpazo, but the violent take it by force. So there, even in our English text, there is a connotation that something is being done in a movement that not, it's not necessarily with speed, but with force. All right, let's take a look at the next, um, the next one there is Matthew 13, 19. So Matthew 13, 19 is the parable of the sower being explained. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, is that where I am? And understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. So catcheth away is the same word, harpazo. You can see the Greek there at the end, harpazai. It's present and active. Now the reason for just looking at this, and I want you to get an idea here. I've seldom seen this be different. You know, people come like that sweet woman that came. I'll never forget. She was such a lovely personality. She came. I don't know where she came from, but she was just sweet. I think she was a little Filipino lady. And she'd write me cards, and she said, you know, you're like, you remind me of the female Apostle Paul. And she was just, it seemed like she was so on fire. You know, the, the word to her was like, wow, this is unbelievable. And I told you the story. She wanted to go back to her church where they had traditions, where she could kneel at the communion railing, and she felt that that was more spiritual than learning about God, even though she was on fire. Well, let me just tell you, there was just a, it was almost like that between her letters telling me how great and how this is so incredible and her going back to her traditions that make void the Word of God. And that's exactly what this passage is saying. Then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. It doesn't, it, it's, it's something, this connotes speed. This is not something slow, a slow process, by the way. Equally by the way, I'd also say that just if you take a look, it's active. He, he does this. He's active. So when people say, you know, what about the devil? Oh, he's active. He's always looking for those people who just come along. They're, they're like babes. They have, nothing has really taken root just yet, and he can pick them off. The next one there we see is in John 6, 15. John 6, 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. So I want to take a, take a look again, by force. They would have taken him by force. This is interesting. So it's an infinitive. I don't want to get into explaining that tonight. We can do that another time because it will bring too much. But remember I said infinitive is not limited to time or to, to people. So it could be a great multitude that wanted to take him by force, if you will. Okay. Now, so we don't go through each and every one of these. Take a look at John 10, 12. The wolf catcheth them, active. Any man pluck them out, active. Now let's go to Acts 8.39. Let's turn there. I'm jumping over a few because I'd like to do some other things. and Sometimes doing a word study is really great because lights come on, but other times just very time consuming. 8.39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. He went on his way rejoicing. Now, Philip was found at Azotus. That means he was raptured sideways. <laughs> he may have gone up, but he went up and he went down, or he went sideways, right? He was here, and then he was there. See, people don't read properly, and a lot of times I find that very disturbing. But let's just get to the, the heart of the matter here. The heart of the matter is that the Spirit, in this case, 
Let's take a look at the grammar. That's a verb, indicative, which is factual statement, aorist, some event that happened, and active. The action was the spirit of the Lord catching away Philip, okay? That's very interesting because he was caught away from one place to another. He didn't, you know, he didn't go up in, in the sky and stay there. He, wherever he went, he, then he appeared somewhere else. Okay, so let's distinguish between that. Nevertheless, this man was moved. Let's just, let's settle the matter. He was moved. Whether he was raptured sideways, right? I know you like that. It sounds good, doesn't it? Now let's take a look at Paul talking in 2 Corinthians 12, and he's describing an experience, and he's not sure, he says it, he's not sure if he is describing something that happened, whether he was in or out of the body. 2 Corinthians 12, I'll start at the beginning, it's not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, he's speaking of, of himself, by the way, whether in the body I cannot tell, or out of the body I cannot tell. He doesn't know, God knoweth. And such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Now let's take a look twice the word occurs there. So in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, such a one caught up, and boy, that's complicated. That's a participle. That's all I'm going to tell you, masculine singular. But I want you to look at the fourth letter in there. And the fourth letter in there denotes that this is passive. Something was acted upon him. He was caught up. Now, there's great, you know, people say, he's, Paul says, he doesn't know. But the grammar gives a little bit of a sense that passively, if he says he was caught up, whether in or out of the body, passively, we know that he didn't imagine himself to be caught up. How's that? But I want you to take a look at 12.4, because 12.4 says how that he was caught up into paradise. And there, it's very clear, the last letter is a P. That stands for passive. It means he was acted upon. And you might think, well, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? A lot. Now let's go, I'm going to jump over 1 Thessalonians 4.17. We're going to go straight to Revelation 12.5. And we'll go, then, we'll, then we'll make our way back to Thessalonians. So uh, Revelation 12.5. And here we have, this chapter begins the woman giving birth to the child. Verse 5 says, She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now let's stop right there. Can you see, again, a P? It ends in a P that's passive. The only issue with this is that, this is what's interesting, this scene takes place and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet. So he says this is a wonder in heaven that took place. So wherever this is appearing, wherever he was, this child from where he saw is caught up to the throne of God. So now we, you know, we, we have several dimensions of things. We have Paul who was on earth. He doesn't know if he was in or out of the body, caught up to the third heaven. We have Philip who, was, who went sideways. I have to say that again because you get a tickle out of it. He was raptured sideways. And here is the word being used and the depiction of all this is what John is seeing in heaven. Now, we, I don't care if you want to say that he's seeing this in heaven, but it's happening on earth. He's seeing it in heaven. He's, this is how the 12th chapter begins. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet. Whether this then begins to be translated as to something on earth, which we will get into later, my concern is that it says, her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. 
Then it says the women fled into the wilderness, which is somewhat confusing because now we're back on earth. But let's leave that alone. I'm simply trying to point out that there's different levels of things happening. The most important thing is the passive. In contradistinction to what happened in Acts 8.39, where the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, we can only say these people were caught away and they, however that, we're going to say God is transporting. But beyond that, the fact that it's in the passive means they're being acted upon. So now let's go to 1 Thessalonians. And let's see what's happening in 1 Thessalonians. And again, whether you want to make this as a, a little bit, a part. 1 Thessalonians 4.17. And I will start with 4.13. But I would not have you be ignorant. Paul likes to say that a lot. I don't know that that's a statement on the people that were around him. Brethren. It adds something when you add the word brethren after it, doesn't it? <laughs> Concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Which, by the way, you know, th these are the passages which I wish some of you, you know, you, there's somebody sitting here tonight that... Uh, their dad was promoted and another's a brother was promoted and another's some distant family members promoted. You read these things. You know, we're not ignorant concerning those which are asleep that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Thank God we have that hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain, boy, it's, I have all kinds of scribbles here, to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, precede them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend, katabeno, descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now take a look at this caught up verb, indicative, future. It's the only one of these examples. That's future and passive. What thinkest thou? Pretty, you know, and people say, well, you know, that doesn't mean anything. Well, yeah, it does. It means that Paul absolutely knew what he was talking about. Now, there's great debate about this text. All I'm telling you is the, the word that we've just looked at tells you that this is a, this is a people moving verb. <laughs> now, you know, there's debate about how this text should be understood. Some people would like to make the rapture a separate event, and then there's the second coming. Some people would like to make this one and the same, where people are raptured up and immediately changed and transported to the battlefield. Oh, I've got to tell you something funny. It just, it, I just remember this. I, I happened to turn on the TV Sunday night, five minutes of... You know, I'm going to go through the channels and see if I can't find something to watch. And, and I happened on a program that was just coming on, on the air. And it had a very fancy opening, and it was some type of, you know, prophecy lunatic on TV. And, and I, I just, I could not believe what I heard because it's just like, what? So this is the headline, you know, that this was just discovered that they just built this major hospital underground in Israel. And, and the guy who's talking says, and this is the Armageddon, this is going to be the Armageddon Hospital. And I am thinking, hey, dude, if you want to have people, you know, obviously you're not reading the same book because it says people are going to be annihilated, right? There, there's not going to be a place to repair the bodies because, hello. But anyway, I heard that one. I was like, wow, that's a new one. The Armageddon Hospital. And it's underground. So it's secret that no one can know about it. <laughs> Good grief. 
Okay. All I'm saying to you is I wanted to, I wanted to show you this because I, I wanted to show you how important the grammar is. You can see how important the grammar is. Um, then we get into to other words. There, these, that exhausts, when people talk about the rapture, that exhausts this particular word, harpazo. Now there are other words being used, which I'm completely fascinated by. I had to look them all up and write them all out because I was like, whoa, I gotta, we'll, we'll do this, not tonight. But it is completely fascinating to me. Now the one thing I want to say is an observation. People get extremely dogmatic about eschatology. And when I say extremely dogmatic, I'm talking about people that will get into these heated debates about things. And men and women have argued this subject for as long as we've had the ability to have it in our hands and discuss it, just like people argued about the Lord's return. Even in Paul's day, where people said, no, you know, you're wasting your time, it already happened. And so what I want to say to you is, I don't want people to get the idea. Uh, I'm on this because I'd like to be able to set at least some solid pegs when people say, okay, show me where you find this. And then show me your other texts. And, and I have been on a quest to just, uh, believe me, I'm, the, I'm of a mindset. My bent is towards, forgive me for saying this, my bent is towards desperately wanting to find all of the uh, refutations for this doctrine because I would, if I had a preference, I, I would say to you, if I was just discussing this as a blank canvas, I don't want to be here when all this happens. Are you kidding me? That's, so you can know where my bent is. I'm, I'm looking for all of the information to build doctrine on. But people will argue this and say, well, that's, that's just one text. Well, it's one text more than many, but I've just shown you all of the diversities of its use. So it does definitely connote um, being moved being moved with force, and most of the time being moved with force and speed. So just think about that, which is interesting th that this word is being used, and then Paul goes on to say about um, the Lord cometh as a th at, like a thief in the night. That's kind of interesting. Speed, force, you can do whatever you want with that. I'm not trying to disseminate the text tonight. I'm just merely, we're looking at words. But now, now that I've done that, uh, I told you I printed out, um, this is Pseudo Ephraim's, uh, it's, a, it's a sermon called, and the end of the world, the Antichrist and the end of the world. What's, what's fascinating about this is that if you are careful to do a little bit of searching, you find that the Pseudo Ephraim, um, who I, I don't believe is pseudo Ephraim. You can dig a little bit and there's a little bit more history to this, but obviously this was written in Syriac, immediately got translated into Latin, Armenian, and Greek, and kind of in its day went viral, okay? Um, so I'm going to read you this just because it's kind of interesting. As I said, we can at least know, no matter who's dating this thing, we can know by 7th, 8th century at the latest, somebody was discussing this, somebody was talking about this subject while most people say, oh no, no one, none of the early church fathers discussed this, none taught on. If you have a, um, the, the volume of books, the post-Nicene um, fathers, all the church fathers, it's a, I think it's a 13 or 14 volume post, uh, pre and post-Nicene uh, fathers, if you look up in the index, you cannot find the subject. You've actually got to go into the homilies. And, and have I found any in there? I found at least one. And it's kind of a very veiled reference. Does that change anything? No, but definitely tells you, as I said, this is kind of interesting. So I'm going to read this to you. Dearly beloved brothers, believe the Holy Spirit speaks in us. We have already told you that the end of the world is near. The consummation remains. Has not faith withered amongst mankind? How many foolish things are seen among youths, and how many crimes among prelates, and how many lies among priests, and how many perjuries among deacons? There are evil deeds among the ministers, adulteries in the aged, wantonness in the youth, immature 
women, false faces, and virgins' dangerous, dangerous traces. In the midst of all this, there are wars with the Persians. We see struggles with diverse nations threatening and kingdom rising against kingdom. He's quoting Matthew. When the Roman Empire begins to be consumed by the sword, the coming of the evil one is at hand. It is necessary that the world come to an end and the completion of the Roman Empire. In those days, two brothers will come to the Roman Empire who will rule with one mind. But because one will surpass the other, there will be a schism between them. And so the adversary will be loosed and will stir up hatred between the Persians and Roman empires. In those days, many will rise up against Rome. The Jewish people will be her adversaries. There will be stirrings of nations and evil reports, pestilence, famine, earthquakes in various places. All nations will receive captives. There will be wars and rumors of wars. From the rising and the setting of the sun, the sword will devour much. The times will be so dangerous that in fear and trembling they will not permit thought of better things because many of the oppressions and desolations of regions that are to come. We ought to understand thoroughly, therefore, my brothers, what is eminent or overhanging. Already there have been hunger and plagues, violent movements, of nations and signs which have been predicted by the Lord, they have already been fulfilled, consummated. And there is not another which remains except the advent of the wicked one in the completion of the Roman kingdom. Why, therefore, are we occupied with worldly business when our mind is held and fixed on the lust of the world or the anxieties of the ages? Why, therefore, do we not reject every care of worldly business? And why is our mind held fixed on the lust of the world I'm sorry, I think I just read that over again. Um, why, therefore, do we not reject every care of earthly actions and prepare ourselves for the meeting of the Lord so that, we may, that He may draw us from the confusion which overwhelms all the world? Believe you me, dearest brother, because the coming advent of the Lord is nigh, believe you me, because the end of the world is at hand, believe me, because it is the very last time. Or do you not believe unless you see with your eyes? So, so it to see that this sentence not be fulfilled among you, the prophet declares, Woe to them who desire to see the day of the Lord. For all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord, lest they see confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. So, brothers, most dear to me, it is the eleventh hour, and the end of the world, and with the end of the world comes the harvest, the angels armed, and prepared, hold sickles in their hands, awaiting the empire of the Lord. And he just keeps going on. But it's, it's one of the earliest examples of a preacher teaching, and I highlighted, for all the saints and the elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come, that are taken to the Lord, lest they see confusion, that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. So, you know, when people say, oh, there's nothing earlier than, you know, the 1800s, no, you just heard it. Um, now, you know, am I going to base my doctrine on, on just that? No. But don't let somebody say this is that and give you half of the matter. Now, I'm going to move on to something. Again, everything becomes a matter of perspective. So let's talk about this. Let's first talk about a bird's eye view. At the end of the seven churches, book of Revelation, the last of the seven churches is mentioned. And then immediately, chapter 4 begins with John hearing a voice that tells him to come up hither. Uh, you know, listen. There's, there's all kinds of things that people have said. Well, you know, he, he says he's, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. But then we also hear Jesus say, what you see, write down. So I don't know, have you ever seen anybody in the Spirit writing? Don't answer that. Um, but yeah, I have all these crazy questions that, I told you, no one can ask more questions than me. But what I want to say that's important is many people base John as a type, and they say that John is a type of the church that is then transported to heaven. What I'd prefer, before we go there, I'd prefer for you to look at the bird's eye view of the book 
and see very clearly that Jesus says, now you write these things, these are admonitions, and if you can figure out where these churches are, they're just a tiny sliver. They're just a tiny sliver. They're not, it's not as, as though they're in far-flung corners of Asia Minor. They're just a small, tiny sliver. Not too, essentially, as juxtaposed to how something else might be further away. They're not that far away from each other. Address the letter to these churches. Whether these churches are these churches or they are the church ages, regardless. And immediately after that, chapter 4 begins with him, John, being told, come up hither. A bird's eye view says, why fuss with all of this um, talking to the churches and then suddenly there's no more talk? So before you go into the mindset of looking at the fourth chapter, understand that I don't think God does anything half or randomly. So there's all this talk, and each one of these churches is being warned. They're being warned, uh, I think, save one church, everyone has a reference to the synagogue or the seed of Satan. And to everyone, it says, to each one that overcomes and is given a promise. And what's very radical is just at a bird's eye view. Sometimes you need to do that. You need to go as far back as you can, and if you were to lay out the whole book, you've got three chapters essentially addressed to, to the churches. And then immediately it's, it's as if, okay, we're done with that, now let's go over here. But I don't believe that that is the right interpretation. I believe the right interpretation is that with all of this being addressed to the churches, and if you read what's going on, it, it's very clear to me, it seems like this is the, if you want to talk about the apostasy that Paul was talking about, it seems like each one of these has issues that I would line up with what Paul is referring to, the apostasy, which we, we are still, by the way, leading up to that moment in time. And then the church is not mentioned again. Now you can say whatever you want. There are people who say, well, I, I don't believe that this doctrine is true, but if you want to deny the doctrine that the church is out of the way and is gone, tell me why did Jesus and John hear our writing addressing the seven churches, and then suddenly it's just like, okay, uh, not even like, okay, now after these things, and now we're moving on to something else, it's just that abrupt. So I think that has to weigh into our understanding of the whole book. And if we understand about what's going on on the earth, what will be poured out on the earth, I think it's a very um, tenable thing to say that when Paul says we are not appointed unto wrath, and many people would begin to argue and say, well, what if the church is not taken out of the way? What if this thing doesn't happen? Well, I just showed you out of Thessalonians. That's a pretty good evidence right there of a future passive event that says we will be acted upon. So, you know, I don't want people to get crazy and say, well, what? tell me, tell me exactly, black and white, what you're what your doctrine is. Well, I'm trying to give you the pieces that are extremely black and white so you can be sure. And whether it's gray dots or speculation, I'll tell you. Now, I do not believe that people are going to experience the wrath of God. The scripture says over and over again, many times over. And those people who have um, hypothesized that a rapture is not doctrinal and cannot occur because it's not it's not talked about, it's not addressed as much as these other things. Like we have many, many uh, abundant proof from, not just from the Gospels and the Epistles, um, the Book of Acts, all state Christ will return. We've got Old Testament references that talk about Christ's return. So when people say, well, I'm not sure, there are people who will say, well, the people who profess that they will be here during the tribulation or a portion. And I'm going to give you the logic. I'm going to lay it all out there. So I'm sure you've had these discussions before. How many have had these discussions where you've talked about this? You've even kind of noodled it in your mind. Good, because that's healthy. There's nothing wrong. You know, if you become an automaton in life, you've got a problem. This is a thinking people's church, right? So if you hypothesize that the church is going to be here, and some have, which has produced the doctrine of a mid-tribulation rapture. And there's a reason for this, and I'll tell you, I mean, it's crystal clear, I don't need to give you my glossary, I'll just tell you. 
because all of this is unfolded before us and we're learning about Antichrist and about this person, about all the, the I mean, we haven't even begun to scratch the layers of things that we'll, we'll see territories and things that must be invaded and things that must be undone before Antichrist can come to power. But in the opening of the seals that the Lamb opens in the sixth chapter of Revelation that releases the four horsemen of the, the apocalypse, and the first one is that man on a white horse, which is Antichrist, who comes as a man of peace. The people who believe in a mid tribulation rapture. They believe that during the first three and a half years, Antichrist will be peaceful, man of peace, peace plan. It's in the middle of that three and a half years that he breaks the covenant, the peace treaty, and then the last three and a half years, essentially all hell breaks loose on, on earth. And therefore, there's this thinking that says, well, Paul said, before the day of the Lord can come, these things must happen. And speaking about the man of lawlessness who must be revealed, and therefore, it, by these people who uh, postulate this, the people in the church will be able to know that this is Antichrist coming on the scene because they will know that he's a, the, the man of peace coming on the scene, will be able to bring everybody to the table, which is why it says then even the very elect if it be possible, even the very elect will be deceived. Their, their position is that that's, that must mean that, and therefore, in the middle of that week, the church will be removed out of the way long enough to see the coming of Antichrist, but before the wrath is poured out on the earth. And that's why I said no one can afford to be highly dogmatic about this particular thing, but there are places, there are passages that we can pick apart and we can see that even woven into those passages that weren't intended to talk about rapture or tribulation, grammar reveals some, not grandma, grammar, reveals something pretty clear about the church. So it's important to do a lot of digging. And as, as I said, this is very tedious. This isn't the type of stuff, you know, if you're the faint of heart and you don't want to sit for hours looking at Strong's numbers and looking at lexicons. This is not for you. But if you're somebody who, who really wants to have a little bit better understanding, I'm, I've said to you, this is helping me along the way. Before I can even help you, I've got to digest all this material. And I will, not, I will never speak something out of my mouth that I haven't digested for myself and absolutely wrap my mind around as, as I have faith in this. If I'm even a little bit unsure of what I'm saying, I'm not even going to speak it. So that's why it's necessary to go down the pathway and kind of peel apart these scriptures, which I'm going to take you to one in a minute. But what I'm trying to say is that there are people who will use these different passages and they will apply them differently. And this is why when I gave you the glossary last week, this is how people have interpreted different things. The people, for example, who say, who are amillennials, who believe that there is no thousand years on earth. Now I tell you that's one department you can just, that you can wad up and you can throw away. And the reason why is that that doctrine of what will happen for a thousand years is clearly spelt out in multiple places which I will take you to eventually and I'll show you the multiple places where God says this is going to happen many times over, not just in one book, not in two books, many times over. When God repeats something you pay attention. Equally, so just put that aside, equally the people who talk about, and I'm, just, you know, we're having conversation here, the people who talk about a secret rapture. I'm completely against that as well. That's been, you know, people have taught this, that um, there's a rapture that's going to occur and no one will know it. No one will know it except those who are truly saved. Then that opens up the door, again, I, I put all this out here because it opens up the door to people trying to define what salvation is. These are things that disturb me because when you get into eschatology, people immediately get into the scare tactics. So you know, make sure that you're right with the Lord because He can come at any time and if you're not right with the Lord, you may not be going with Him. Now, uh, listen, if, if God is real in your life and you have a real relationship, 
you're going to be, your eyes are always going to be looking towards his appearing and towards being with him, whether it is that you die here and you wake up in his presence or that you're transported and you're with him immediately. So I don't like these scare tactic things, but I'm simply saying uh, there's doctrines I cannot take to because I don't believe that it could be so. Let's go back to some things that God did, and when he did them, he didn't try to hide them. Do you think that Noah could have hid that ark? You know how big that ark was? He said, build me an ark, and this ark, I mean, I heard there's some exhibit going on now, and somewhere it's the live-size ark. Yeah, okay. I wonder if they're going to have the life-size... Never mind. <laughs> Do you think that God could have hid that ark somewhere? I think people passed by and laughed at Noah. Never been a flood on the earth in the, in the eyes of those who were alive at that time. And yet God brought it on. And I believe that when the flood came... If you read how quickly, well, we're reading in chapter and verse, but let's just assume that this all happened rather rapidly. Let's talk about the death angel passing over and wiping out how many hundreds or millions in Egypt. Get those who applied the blood I want you to kind of think about these things. Was that secret? Was that done in secret? No. Now, it applied to that place then and there. I'm not so sure that that would have made sense to the people living in India. Never mind, that'll get you later. But it was for those people right then and there. And there was nothing secret about it. So I, I completely, I do not believe this thing about a secret rapture. That I don't believe. And as we unfold all of this, you begin to realize that certain things do become crystal clear, that are absolute. We know the Lord is going to come back. That's an absolute. Anybody who sets a date is a lunatic. Okay? I've got two bookshelves, and they're pretty big bookshelves, with people who have set dates. And I've kind of tried to start lining up chronologically. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 1984, are you ready? You know, there's a couple of those. In the 80s, it was really big for people to, you know, put a date to it. Only a lunatic would put a date to that. You know, that guy, Harold Camping, and you know, he put dates, you know, the Lord's going to come back and the, the doom of the earth. And, you know, all that does is it makes people look nutty. And it's so plain, we read in the Bible of these things that must happen happen, and they have not yet happened. Now, can God change his mind? He can, but then he wouldn't be fulfilling his word, and God is he has been faithful to fulfill his word. That's what Jeremiah's statement was. So, we can know certain things must happen. I know for some new people who are listening to this teaching, they're probably going, wow, this, is, this kind of sounds kooky. You know, this is crazy stuff. You believe this stuff? Yeah, I do. And I believe it for a reason, by the way. I, I, I'm not even going to get into that tonight because I will give a defense eventually of why I believe this. All this is important. When, when you begin to talk about end times, all of this is important. But now let me take you to a text, which I'm not telling you that this is, a, oh, this is the smoking gun for everybody. I'm just taking you to a text that I want to show you something nestled into the text that you can understand sometimes we might find evidence for things not plainly stated as clear as, for example, the word Trinity, which doesn't appear in the Bible, and yet we know about God praying to the Father and saying, I must go away, for if I don't go away, the Comforter will not come, the Holy Spirit, right? So here in Revelation 3, to the letter to the church at Philadelphia, And as I said, each one of these has something that has an issue. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, 
no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and to worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. And I'm focusing right now on verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, who por menos endurance literally, I I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world. That is tribulation, the great tribulation, the hour of temptation. But what's equally kind of fascinating about this is how this reads in the Greek. But let me finish. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which, which shall come upon all the world to try them, peresai, that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So let's stop and let's go back to 10. So keep thee, the word in the Greek is terasso, to guard, to protect. And that's not really very staggering, but it's the word that comes after it that is, which in the Greek is ek. And I started writing abundantly about this earlier. Ek can be, depending on if it's in the, what case it's in. In this case, it's in the genitive. But ek can be from, as they've translated it, but it can also be out or away from. And when you read this, depending on your translation, I will also keep thee out of the hour of temptation because of the, it's very simple, not getting into too much difficulty here in translation. And it's juxtaposed, by the way, keeping thee out of the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. And there's something interesting about the dwell upon the earth, the dwell upon the earth, uh, Thayer uses this word as the idea of permanence, those that are there lastingly. So just in 310, even though the text itself is not trying to denote a greater thing like the removal of people from where they are, the Greek gives that keep thee, but essentially out of the hour. The hour of temptation is tribulation, the great tribulation. So think about these things. You can find, you know, you can read through the text, and if you begin to read carefully, you find that there are many things that you hadn't considered before. So when people start to talk about this, and we'll, we'll find all of the text. I'm determined to find every text to shore up a foundation for something that when we say we, we believe this, we believe it with all of these scriptures supporting it. And that's what my goal is. Now, shifting gears, I want to make reference to one thing I had not addressed, and that is, <laughs> some of you are going to hate me when I say this, back to the matter of our investigation last week of what I'm going to say it this way. What will unleash, what will enable Antichrist to come to, come to be revealed? You now, when you read that, some of you who do read Greek, I really challenge you to go back and read the Second Thessalonians we were struggling through last week. I did the Greek on it. But if you're, if you're able to read Greek, it's an interesting the way it's structured, it's very interesting because what it suggests is that something enables Antichrist. We looked at that. It was a neutral. Remember that? It was a neutral. And as I began reading and doing my own patchwork, I referenced this Sunday morning, so I'm addressing this now. Revelation 5 and 6 kind of give you an idea that maybe, gosh, maybe the whole church world, I haven't heard anybody present this like this, and I'm, I'm simply making a statement 
and then you can do whatever you want with it. The whole church world, I've got probably every book that's ever been penned on this subject. And every single person has come up with different hypotheses of what, what is the force. And I showed you why the neutral is problematic. I've said the church is feminine. And the only neutrals that align I didn't really make sense. But I want you to just indulge me. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes here, and I'm going to read Revelation 5 and part of 6. And then I want you to go back in your own time and think about who or what would have the power to put things in motion for Antichrist to be revealed. Revelation 5, John the seer is writing, And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud vo voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. I want you to scratch out one word, hath prevailed. Scratch prevailed out. This shouldn't be there. It says, he hath prevailed. Sounds like he struggled. He can open the book. He's able to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. By the way, this is very interesting. This lamb, who is Christ, but this lamb is neutral. I didn't make that up. As it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book, which is also neutral, out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors. I like that because I don't want to know what the odors are. Incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and every tongue and people and nation. And thou hast made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. Lots of things being said in here, by the way, that we just psh, we read right over. And we shall reign on earth. This is happening in heaven, they say, and we shall reign on earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. Now, I want you to keep thinking about this under the earth. That will be valuable at a later time. And such as are in the sea, and all them that, and all them that, uh, that, that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. 
And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Let's stop right there because that's, that's, that's Antichrist coming, coming on the scene. But what unleashed Antichrist? Or who? So I said to you, sometimes the things we condition our, our, our minds to think a certain way, this kind of sets the stage because, you know, it's, it's almost like somebody saying, well, what about Satan? Let's go back to the discussion on Satan because this clarifies this passage. Satan's a created being, created, made by God, created. Now, in rebellion, roaming the earth, roaming the heavens, one day will be cast completely out and down to earth completely. And my point is that the same concept that acknowledges that understanding, acknowledges this, there is a greater force at work, a controlling force that is God. He, only He knows, by the way, when everything has, I don't want to say aligned up, when all things have come to pass and that time is. And I believe He's the one. He's opening, the Lamb is opening up the seals that unleash and let loose Antichrist. Now in your own time, go back and read 2 Thessalonians, I'm not saying that there's any problem that's been solved, but I have heard nobody propose this. And quite frankly, if we're going to talk about the ultimate for force that has the power, here's the ultimate force opening up the seals. No one else could. And by the way, just a parenthetical sidebar, forgive me for doing this, but I believe that the mystery of what was sealed here, this book that was sealed, the mystery of this is the mystery that Daniel is told, seal up the prophecy. It's not for you to know in this time, but it's for the latter days. Now, all I'm going to say to you is, you know, I think God has His hand in all of this. And when we read it just as it appears, it, it becomes, forgive me, a little bit less mysterious and a little bit less of a puzzle when you begin to put these things together and recognize. As I said, the church to me, even if we just take the pockets of church, churches that remain. Look at the church that is described at the beginning of this book of Revelation. You begin to realize that this is not a powerful church. Whether these represent church ages or just seven churches of Asia, not one of these churches is without, uh, we'll say it this way, they do not come across as a force that is keeping anything in check. But I just told you there is a force operating here that opens up the seal, that opens up the seal that Antichrist now is revealed on the scene. So you go back and read 2 Thessalonians with that mindset and a little more clarity might come to the passage because in the big picture we may say we still have to resist. We still, we still have to be the beacon. We still have to be ambassadors for Christ. I see my calling as that, an ambassador for Christ, someone who's going to keep preaching the Word no matter what any other ministry does or wants to come up with a new gimmick or that's why I tell you about giving, giving your commitments the way you commit your way to Him, your problems, your life, your children, your marriage, everything you do, even your job. And you begin to function in that realm, it's radically different. You become, you are a saint of God that is belonging to Him. You are His. So are we to keep fighting and are we to keep resisting? Absolutely. But I believe that the, the text speaks for itself and explains much. If you go back and reread 2 Thessalonians, the passage we, and we'll revisit it again. We're not done with it. But it's like, how much can you take in one night and <laughs> how much do you want to take in one night? But right now, that's what I want to leave you with. Uh, I think we need to just keep peeling back these texts I would like to take a break and we come back, uh, maybe spend a little bit of time somewhere else, just as a little footnote. Right now, I need you to get on the telephone. Reservations, commitments, get busy. Okay, I said I'd take you to one more place, and that is because I wanted to, wanted to put a capstone on something. You know, you, 
you go through the books of the Bible, and I mentioned the seals, and that's why I want to just read one brief thing. If you want to turn to Daniel 12, I'll just say something very quick there. But I want you to know I started doing a lot of these word studies in preparation for these festivals. Um, some of them were kind of to prove a point, like we did tonight, to show you the verbs, to help you to understand future passive, that's important, so we're not trying to eject ourselves. Huh? The different type of movements that have occurred using that same word. Um, I just started doing, and it's kind of laborious, but I, I want to do it because I want to do it right. I just started doing an analysis side by side of the um, Septuagint, so the Greek Daniel and the um, Aramaic, because I'm finding discrepancies of things that I just intuitively, and then you go in and you look and you say, wow, that, that's not even the right word that they used here or there. So, but along the way, um, what it's doing is it's giving me other information that I wasn't trying to find. Um, and I think when we're done, we're just going to have a lot of solid pieces, and that's what I'm going for. So I don't want you to think I'm just, I told you, I'm just going to keep laying stuff out I want to I want to do things um, in such a way that we can peel back even things we've we've looked at that are solid solid doctrine. I want to be able to peel th those things back as well and put substance underneath them, more substance, because I think each one of us will have more and more opportunities. I think we live in a different time now. I think I've woken some of you up to the fact that um, we do we live. This ministry has a completely, when I say different time frame on it, I think when you are living with eternity, when you are living, looking in that direction, you see the opportunities around you. And many times I don't try and talk to people and just say, hey, you want to know about Jesus? But a lot of times people will talk to me. I was sitting with a lady last week who I've known for many years. I never asked her about her faith, and she just said to me, you know, she said, I'm Catholic, and she started telling me all this, like the water opened up somewhere. Somebody opened up the spigot, you know. And I said to her, well, that's it's good that you're a Catholic. It's good. Do you know why you're a Catholic? I, I asked her the question, what, what, what do you believe? What, what do you believe? So I'm just curious. You know, she started to tell me, you know, well, I think this, and I, I kind of think that. There was nothing really certain. And I said, well, have you ever considered maybe looking for certainty? Well, I have, but I just don't know where to, I don't know who to ask or where to turn to. <laughs> so, but I think each and every one of us will have those opportunities. And whether it's the most important Thing, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because that's, that's the whole, that's our faith. Or whether it's in these discussions where somebody says, okay, well, tell me why you believe this. Because I met a lot of people discussing um, end times, and they don't even know why they believe what they believe. They don't, they, they don't have abundant scripture like other places. You talk about Jesus raised from the dead, and you can point to the scriptures and you can point to certain things, but when it comes to this, people are somewhat vague and somewhat ambiguous. And unfortunately, a lot of it is, well, um, they heard or it was said. And I've told you, like everything else, give me the facts. Give me chapter and verse, give me the facts. Tell me where you got it from, I wanna know, I wanna read it. If you, if you find something that I haven't considered, by the way, I wanna know about it. And I'm not talking about you, I'm talking in general. I wanna know about it. So, Anyway, now, I want to go back and reread one thing in Daniel, which has just to do about something here in chapter 12. And I'll just read the whole chapter. It's just 13 verses. 
And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And somebody asked me, could, could Michael have been the, the withholder? Well, the only problem is that Michael is the angel sent to thy people, speaking of Daniel's people. Be careful about how you interpret things, right? So, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. Everyone, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Thy people. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Do you know that in all of the Old Testament, that's probably the clearest passage to say how the dead will be raised up, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, even the time of the end, to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two on the other side of the bank of the river, and on the other side, so one on each side. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Question of the ages, how long? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, and he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times and a half, and we'll go through that, but some of you probably got plenty of notes in your Bible about three and a half years, but we'll talk about that when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, and all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the end of time. Many shall be purified, made white, and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to, to the three, I'm sorry, to the thousand three hundred and thirty-five days. It's interesting these these numbers, which we'll talk about eventually as well. But he says. But go thou, thou, go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. In other words, it's not for you to know. And that was Daniel. Seal this up. It's for the end. You've got other places. Isaiah has one of those. Seal it up. It's not for now. You've got a plea in Habakkuk, which kind of has, if rightly interpreted, a same type of statement which all points to a time, of course, we just read in Revelation, when these things shall be unfolded and revealed. But it takes the one who is able to open up the book to um, begin the process, if you will. So, you know, people talk about date setting and how will we know and what's going to happen. Well, there are things that must happen and we'll cover those. And I think anybody who's seriously studying prophecy who is a serious student of the Bible and of prophecy, shouldn't be freaked out, shouldn't, be, shouldn't have anxiety or be anxious. I, I do worry a little bit about some of the younger people in the church who don't have as much time and as, as much um, faith muscles that hear some of these things, and to them could be really scary when you consider some of these things that are going to happen upon the earth. But then again, ask the question, you know, if you plan to be here, then yeah, it's going to be scary. If you don't plan to be here, then no problem, right? Do I look worried? 
So <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. But now look, I need your reservations, your commitments. I'm so excited to make this journey. And as I said, it's a labor to put down each one of these festivals is another piece of the puzzle that we just have to keep putting together in word study and then going back and examining and examining, examining until we have enough put down to put it all together. And I think it'll be uh, a good study for all of us. Those who are here for a long time and those who are just getting started will all kind of come along together. But right now, I need you to do one thing. That's get on the telephone. Get busy.